Good evening. And it's so good to have so many of you here in the library on this Wednesday evening to join us for this event. Um, I'd first like to rec recognize our board chairperson and I think, well I saw Dr. Franklin here. We have two board members who are here. Dr. Bale, who is chairman of our board. And Dr. Janice Franklin, who is director of Alabama State University's Levi Watkins Library, who is also a member of our board. Oh, wave your hand, Dr. Franklin. <laughs> and then our library staff, if you will wave, wave your hands. This has been a long time coming. Uh, we, ha we received emails last summer about this opportunity and immediately we said yes. And then we found out that Dr. Anderson was right over in Atlanta. We said, oh yeah, homegirl, come on over. <laughs> <laughs> and so we were very pleased with that. And as director of the library, before we go any further, I would like to present on behalf of the library and the board and the mayor of Montgomery, to Dr. Kendi and Dr. Anderson, two books about us. Oh. One is Journey Toward Justice, Juliet Hampton Morgan, this library is named for her. And the other is The Desegregation of Public Libraries in Gr Jim Crow South. Yes. And so we'd like for you all to have these as a memory of who we are in Montgomery and what we're trying to do in Montgomery because it does tell the historic history of w the way things were here. Oh, thank okay. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We hope that you enjoy our facility today. It is spanking new. A year ago this month, we completed a $3 million renovation of it. And I hope that you can see that your tax dollars have been used well. I'd like to now introduce to you Mark Lee, who is with the National Book Foundation. He is the Marketing and Communications Manager for the National Book Foundation. He comes to the nonprofit world with a background in book publishing. He served in publicity and marketing roles at both Knopf and Doubleday where he worked on campaigns for multiple New York Times best-selling authors, including National Book Award finalist Hanya Yanagihara and National Book Award winner Colson Whiteth. Ladies and gentlemen, Mark Lee. Okay, hello everyone. Um, I will try to make this uh, not the driest portion of the evening, but <laughs> the intro might be. Um, my name is Mark Lee, um, thank you so much. I am the Marketing and Communications Manager at the National Book Foundation. Um, we are so grateful to be here tonight um, at the Montgomery City County Public Library, um, and just in Alabama and in this area, it's been amazing. Um, the welcome has been so warm and we're so happy to be here. Um, to start, just a quick introduction about the National Book Foundation. Our mission is to celebrate the best literature in America, expand its audience, and ensure that books have a prominent place in American culture. While we are best known for the National Book Awards, of course, we also host educational and public programming across the country year round. Uh, these are initiatives that provide education and access to communities throughout the nation, like Book Rich Environments, um, a program that has provided, as of this year, um, over one million free books, new books, um, to families living in public housing authorities. Um, we also um, run Book Up, which is a writer-led reading club for middle school students. Um, we are vastly expanding our public programming this year, um, like with the event tonight, um, with NBF Presents, uh, which brings National Book Awards National Book Award honored authors to universities, community colleges, libraries, and festivals in dozens of states uh, from Idaho to Virginia, um, to California, to Colorado, Arkansas, and Alabama, and many more. 
Uh, also this last year, uh, we launched Literature for Justice, which works to contextualize and humanize mass incarceration through contemporary literature. Um, we also launched this past year, um, Author in Focus, um, which focuses on uh, the works of a seminal National Book Awards honored author. Uh, we are focusing on James Baldwin in the first year, um, and so we are doing public events and school visits across the country. Um, this is really just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, we are doing so much work at the foundation because we believe in the power of books. We believe that they matter and uh, we work year round to make sure that they continue to do so. Um, before I get to the bios, I want to give um, a quick but heartfelt thank you uh, to all the staff um, at the library here. Um, we are so happy to be here. Um, special thanks to Juanita Oz, uh, Karen Pruce, um, they were instrumental in organizing tonight's event. Um, special thanks to uh, New South Bookstore, uh, who is selling books tonight. So afterward, make sure to go check out, uh, get your books. Um, and thank you also, obviously, to Dr. Tremble, who will be moderating tonight's event. Um, you can follow us, sorry, I have to say it as the communications guy. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter at National Book. You can follow us on Instagram at National Book Foundation. And you can follow us on Facebook at National Book FDN. Those were all correct. I hope you're writing them down. Um, I will also, um, I will put some sheets um, outside afterward um, for our newsletter sign up just to keep abreast of what's happening with the foundation. Um, we really are doing so much all year. Uh, now, to introduce the panel, um, first up, uh, our moderator for the evening. Jacqueline Allen Trimble is a Cave Conum Fellow and a 2017 Alabama State Council on the Arts Literary Fellow. Yay. Her, yeah, nice. Uh, her poetry has appeared in various journals, including the Louisville, the Louisville Review, The Offing, and Poet Lore. Published by New South Books, American Happiness, her debut collection, was named the best book of 2016 by Seven Sisters Book Awards and won the 2016 Balcones Poetry Prize. Trimble is professor of English and chairs the Department of Languages and Literatures at Alabama State University. And our two authors. Ibram X. Kendi is the founding director of the Anti-Racist Research and Policy Center at American University. He is professor of history and international relations and an ideas columnist at The Atlantic. His second book, Stamped from the Beginning, The Definitive History of Racist Ideas in America, won the 2016 National Book Award for nonfiction and was a New York Times bestseller. At 34 years old, he was the youngest ever winner of the NBA for nonfiction. Stamped from, the, Stamped from the Beginning was a finalist for a National Book Critics Circle Award, and it was nominated for a Hurston Wright Legacy Award and an NAACP Image Award. Kendi is also the author of the award-winning book, The Black Campus Movement, and he's published essays in numerous periodicals, including The New York Times and The Washington Post. His next book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, will be published in 2019 by One World, an imprint of Random House. Carol Anderson is the Charles Howard Candler Professor and Chair of African American Studies at Emory University. She's the author of several award-winning books, including Eyes Off the Prize, The United Nations and the African American Struggle for Human Rights, 1944 to 1955, the New York Times bestseller, White Rage, The Unspoken Truth of Our Racial Divide, which won the 2016 National Book Critics Circle Award for Criticism and is also a New York Times bestseller and, what else was it? A New York Times editor's pick. And her most recent book, One Person No Vote, How Voter Suppression is Destroying Our Democracy, which was long listed for the National Book Award in Nonfiction and was a finalist for the Penn Galbraith Book Award in Nonfiction. Her research has garnered substantial fellowships and grants from the American Council of Learned Societies, the Ford Foundation, National Humanities Center, and Harvard University's Charles Warren Center. Currently, she is a Guggenheim Fellow in Constitutional Studies. So to kick things off, we will invite Carol up to, get, uh, to do a brief reading. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. And I know there's so much going on. And so the fact that you're here, truly honored, truly honored. What I'd like to do is to do a, a passage from the book based on the lie. I'm just going to call it out. Somebody said I, I don't stutter. The lie of voter fraud Yeah. and how we got here. Just as in Florida, 
Election Day 2000 in St. Louis was a chaotic mess. <laughs> The St. Louis Board of Elections had not only illegally purged nearly 50,000 names from the voter rolls in key Democratic precincts, but had also failed, as the law required, to notify the people that the board had just disfranchised. Not surprisingly then, when those voters showed up to cast their ballots, they were told they were no longer registered. Besieged precinct workers couldn't get through on the jam phone lines to check or double check much of anything and opted at that point to send frustrated would-be voters downtown to the Board of Elections. This was a train to nowhere. Mm. Poor record keeping and ill-prepared and ill-informed officials meant that hours and hours dissolved away as the clock on election day wound down. By early evening, the lobby at the board was shoulder to shoulder with people who wanted to vote. But by then, it was near closing time at the polls. Mm -hmm. Democrats filed for an injunction to keep the doors open at the precincts for a few more hours to accommodate voters who had been caught in the Board of Elections illegal purge and run around. Missouri Republicans, however, twisted this clear case of election board wrongdoing into a torrent of accusations against the overwhelmingly black residents in St. Louis and the Democrats. Mm -hmm. Senator Kit Bond, he alleged that the attempt to keep the polls open was a brazen, shocking, astonishing, and stunning effort to commit voter fraud <laughs> with dead people registering and voting from the grave, fake names and phony addresses proliferating across the nation's voter rolls and dogs registering and people signing up to vote from vacant lots. This was, he continued, a major criminal enterprise designed to defraud voters. It was not, but for the GOP, that was not the point, rather, the Republicans used this bungled election to walk away with several key lessons. The first was that demographics were not destiny. Paul Weyrich, a conservative activist and founder of the American Legislative Exchange Council, which eventually crafted voter suppression legislation that spread like a cancer throughout the United States, was brutally clear. I don't want everybody to vote. Mm -hmm. That's right. The Republican Party's leverage in the elections, quite candidly, goes up as the voting populace goes down. That is to say, the GOP learned that voter suppression applied ruthlessly and relentlessly could deliver victory. The second lesson was the importance of controlling the electoral machinery that decided the rules for voting the conditions upon which those votes would be cast, and whose vote counted, and whose did not. The final and perhaps most important lesson was to lie. <laughs> lie often, <laughs> loudly, <laughs> boldly, unashamedly, <laughs> and consistently. Lie until it drowned out the truth. Lie until no amount of evidence could prove otherwise. Lie until there was no other reigning narrative. Just lie. There is, for instance, no record anywhere of Fido, Rover, Lassie, or even the infamous <laughs> Ritzy casting a ballot. Similarly, the specter of a swarm of fraudulent voters using the addresses of vacant lots to tilt the election to the Democrats, while salacious and tantalizing, collapsed under scrutiny. Mm -hmm. In fact, by the time every one of Kit Bond's 300 plus claims was investigated, it was clear that out of 2.3 million voters in Missouri, the four people who committed some type of malfeasance at the poll hardly constituted the brazen, shocking, <laughs> astonishing, and stunning voter fraud that he claimed. Mm -hmm. And it was also obvious that none of those problems could have been resolved by requiring photo ID at the polls. Mm -hmm. 
Yet, from the tattered cloths of bureaucratic snafus, administrative incompetency, and typographical errors, <laughs> the lie of rampant, massive voter fraud hung there, dangling, as the senator kept fashioning democracy's noose. Lovely. honor uh, for me to be here, here in Montgomery, uh, here uh, on behalf of the National Book Foundation, uh, here uh, on a panel with, of course, Carol Anderson. Um, and it's, I'm going to be reading a passage from, from Stamp from the Beginning from a chapter entitled Ready for Freedom mm -hmm. and Reconstructing Slavery. Mm -hmm. And this passage really situates and allows us to sort of historicize the current growing debate that Americans are having right now over reparations. Mm -hmm. So it's, this, this passage is set in the early part of 1865. A general, William T. Sherman, had sacked Alabama, Union General William T. Sherman had had sacked Alabama, turning the tide of the Civil War, and engaged in a march to the sea where he captured Savannah. Secretary of War Edwin McMaster Stanton arrived in Savannah after the new year and urged General Sherman to meet with local blacks over their future. Meeting with 20 leaders, mostly Baptist and Methodist ministers, on January 12, 1865, General Sherman received a crash course on their definitions of slavery and freedom. Mm -hmm. Slavery meant receiving by irresistible power the work of another man and not by his consent, said the group's spokesman, Garrison Frazier. Freedom was placing us where we could reap the fruit of our own labor. To accomplish this, to truly be free, we must have land. Mm -hmm. When asked whether they desired interracial communities, Frazier shared their preference to live by ourselves. Mm -hmm. There was a prejudice against us in the South that will take years to get over. Black people all over the South we're saying this to union officials. Do not abolish slavery and leave us landless. Do not force us to work for our former masters and call that freedom. Mm -hmm. They distinguish between abolishing slavery and freeing people. You can only set us free by providing us with land to till by our own labor, they declared. In offering post-war policy, black people were rewriting what it meant to be free. And in anti-racist fashion, they were rejecting integration as a race relations strategy that involved blacks showing whites their equal humanity. They were rejecting uplift suasion, rejecting the job of working to undo the racist ideas of whites by not performing stereotypes. Racist ideas, they were saying, were only in the eyes of the beholder. And only the beholders of racist ideas were responsible for their release. Savannah Blacks did not mention this, but millions of white settlers who had acquired Western land confiscated from rebel native communities over the years had been freed. These, these Savannah blacks, their peers across the South were only asking for the same from rebel Confederate communities. But, but racist ideas rationalized the racist policy. White settlers on government provided land were deemed receivers of American freedom. Black people, receivers of American handouts. Whenever talks earlier in the war touched on distributing land 
to black people, Americans showed a respect for the landed rights of warring Confederates that they rarely showed for the landed rights of peaceful Native Americans. Mm -hmm. Since the federal government had started selling confiscated and abandoned Southern land to private owners in 1863, more than 90% had gone to Northern whites over the widespread protest of, of local blacks. Mm -hmm. Four days after he met with Savannah Blacks, General Sherman issued Special Field Order Number 15 to rid his camps of runaways and to punish Confederates. He opened settlements for black families on 40-acre plots of land on the Sea Islands and a large slice of the coastal areas of South Carolina and Georgia. By June of 1865, 40,000 people had settled on the plots and had, and had been given an old army mule. Mm -hmm. Sherman's field order was not the first of its kind. Black squatters on the Mississippi land of Jefferson Davis's family had formed their own government and swung a cotton profit of $160,000. Davis Bend became a testament of what Savannah blacks were saying in those days. All black people needed was to be left alone, mm -hmm. secure on their own lands, and guaranteed with their own rights. Mm -hmm. And yet, for so many racist Americans, it was inconceivable that black people had not been damaged by slavery, mm -hmm. that, that black people could dance into freedom without skipping a beat. Mm -hmm. General John C. Robertson worried about land owning quote, sluggish blacks preventing the energy and industry of the North from utilizing the valuable acreage. Mm -hmm. Frederick Douglass and Horace Greeley rebuked Sherman's order, calling for interracial communities and ignoring the desires of local blacks. Greeley wrote in his New York Tribune on January 30th, 1865, that, that Southern blacks, like their fellows at the North, must be aided by the contact with white civilization to become good citizens and enlightened men. Fast forward, Lincoln is assassinated. President Andrew Johnson issues his reconstruction proclamations on May 29, 1865, deflating the high hopes of civil rights activists. He offered amnesty, property rights, and voting rights to all but the highest Confederate officials, most of whom he pardoned later in the year. Feeling empowered by President Johnson, Confederates barred blacks from voting, elected Confederates as politicians, and instituted a series of discriminatory black codes at their constitutional conventions to reformulate their state in the summer and fall of 1865. With the 13th Amendment barring slavery, except as a punishment for crime, the law replaced the master. Mm. The post-war South became the spitting image of the pre-war South mm. in everything but name. Mm. Of course, lawmakers justified these new racist policies with racist ideas. They, they proclaimed that the black codes, which forced blacks into labor contracts, barred their movement, and regulated their family lives, were meant to restrain them because they were naturally lazy, lawless, and oversexed. If you call this freedom, a black veteran asked, what do you call slavery? <laughs> Southern blacks defended themselves in this war of re-enslavement lifted up demands for rights and land and issued brilliant anti-racist retorts to the prevailing racist ideas. If any group should be characterized as lazy, it was the planters who had lived in <laughs> idleness all their lives on stolen labor, resolved the P P Petersburg, Virginia mass meeting. It had always been amazing to enslaved people how someone could lounge back drink lemonade, and look out over their fields and call the bent over pickers lazy. Right. To the racist forecast that blacks would not be able to take care of themselves, one emancipated person was replied, 
we used to support ourselves and our masters too <laughs> when we were slaves, and I reckon we can take care of ourselves now. When President Johnson evicted blacks from their 40-acre plots in the summer and fall of 1865, black people protested. We have a right to the land we are located, Virginia's Bailey Wyatt griped. Our wives, our children, our husbands has been sold over and over again to purchase the lands we now locate upon. Thank you. Mm. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, I am so delighted to be here. And um, as I told Dr. Anderson a little earlier this evening, I would have been willing to Game of Thrones somebody <laughs> to be in this position right here. So uh, I'm, I love these books. I love these books. And they are in conversation with each other. Almost totally. I mean, it's like y'all are sitting there talking to each other. Um, and so I believe both of these books are both timely and completely necessary. Um, the other thing I, I want to point out about both these books is something my students always say. They bring the receipts. <laughs> um, so I want to ask you both about the genesis of your books. And I'm going to start with you, Dr. Kendi. Um, you began by talking about witnessing via television the um, murder, I'm going to use that word, of um, various unarmed black people. You talk about Trayvon Martin, um, Michael Brown, the Charleston Nine, and so many others. And you use the word heartbreaks, heartbreaks, when you say that, to describe these killings and the historical moment um, out of which you wrote this book. And I love that this begins in a sort of very visceral moment. So why is it important? that you connect these deaths to America's history of racist ideas and stamp from the beginning. How does this book come out of that history and basically serve as your response to these deaths? And in many ways, how does it represent your <coughs> grappling with where we are and how we got here? That's a lot of questions. So, okay, so let's start I, with. No, 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 I get it. Okay, all right, all right. I mean, I, right. I, I know, I know how, how. You know what I'm talking about. You know here, what I'm so, talking about. Um, okay. So I think, first, from an historical standpoint, I yeah. started writing the book uh, weeks after Trayvon Martin uh, was was killed right. and or, or was murdered. Yeah. And so, as many of you know, he was murdered, and then there was this <laughs> protest push mm -hmm. for. Um, George Zimmerman to be arrested, and then there was a even you know, and so it became a sort of uh, visceral case, obviously for many of us. And, and so for me, that I started literally um, writing this book in a particular period of Trayvon Martin, and I ended the book around the time I heard her name, Sandra Blom. Mm -hmm. So that's when I was sort of writing between, um, and so for me, clearly the consistent deaths uh, and murders of, of black people, uh, black police officers, resulted in a pretty seismic debate, mm -hmm. an argument among Americans. And that argument was indicative of an argument Americans have always been having. Mm -hmm. And to give it context, from 2010 to 2012, young black men were 22 times more likely to be killed by police mm -hmm. than young white men. And, and so the question that we were arguing as a nation was why? Right. And you, have, you had some Americans who were arguing that young black men are 22 times more reckless with the police, mm -hmm. that young black men are too violent, that there's something wrong with young black men. They are causing. Mm -hmm their own deaths. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, they were defending the police. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you had other Americans saying that 
the cause of that disparity are the racist ideas of the police officers. The reasons why these police officers are able to get away with these deaths are the racist policies uh, within the criminal justice system. Uh, the reason why Americans have colored danger black, including police officers, is because the policies that drove up mass incarceration. So basically, it's racism. Mm -hmm. So right. Americans That's were right. arguing, is it there's something wrong with black people, <laughs> or is there something wrong with society, mm -hmm. i.e. Mm -hmm. racism? And, and so really, Stamp from the Beginning is, is a collision of those two ideas. Yeah. And, and we've been having those arguments from the beginning of this country. So Dr. Anderson, I'm going to ask you a very similar question. Your book, One Person, No Vote, considers another equally pernicious history, and that's the history of voter suppression uh, and the current practices of voter suppression. And your earlier book, which I love too, White Rage, is really about the pushback of white America against black gains, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. every time there's some progress, there's got to be some policies, some politics to push back, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I want you to talk about how the election of Barack Obama contributed to the rise of white rage mm. and how voter suppression is really a consequence of that rage. And then what inspired you to write this book? Okay. That's a really good segue. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things that we often hear is, well, not now, but back then in those days before then. How racist can America be? <laughs> we elected a black man twice to the White uh, House. How many of you have heard that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah right, right? We, we heard it, and, and it's, it is part of the embrace that we pat ourselves on the back mm -hmm. because we have, pat, we have gone past this kind of racial Rubicon, right? Mm -hmm. You know, we have made it. We elected a black man twice to the White House. Mm -hmm. Well. <laughs> no, we did not. Yeah. Because when you hear that we, what it's saying is that the majority of white Americans voted for Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. And so that proves that racism is no longer functioning in the United States. Right. Well, truth. The majority of whites have not voted for a Democratic candidate for president since 1964. Mm -hmm. Since the pre yeah, oh, I love that look on your face. You're like, what you talking about, Willis? <laughs> I mean, it went, Roo -roo. <laughs> it has Scooby-Doo and all of it all over there, right? Um, and, and, and that, you know, when you think about it, when you had Lyndon Johnson mm -hmm. sign the Civil Rights Act of 1964 that said that we would put the power of the federal government behind enforcing the citizenship rights of African Americans. That's right. The majority of whites have not voted for a Democratic candidate for president in the majority since then. Mm -hmm. That's right. And so we did not get a majority of whites voting for Barack Obama in 2008, nor in 2012. Mm -hmm. You had a sizable number, not the majority. But what Barack Obama brought was an incredible ground game. Mm -hmm massive grassroots organizing that put 15 million new voters on the rolls and to the polls. Mm -hmm. Whew. And that 15 million overwhelmingly African American, so we gotta pay attention to this demographic, mm -hmm. overwhelmingly African American, Hispanic, Asian American, young and poor. Mm -hmm. That's the coalition. Republicans looked at that and went, oh, we got to take them down. <laughs> it, it was like, uh-uh. That is the hit list for voter suppression. Mm -hmm. It really got implemented with the Shelby County v. Holder decision uh, that gutted the Voting Rights Act. Right. And that's when just, you know, Texas, two hours after that decision, implements mm -hmm. voter ID law mm -hmm. that has been repeatedly found by the federal courts to be racially discriminatory. Mm -hmm. Repeatedly. That would be over and over in <laughs> Texas. I'm Boy, and Texas will tweak it, put a comma in there, see we changed the law. Uh -huh. <laughs> right? right? And boom, it's implemented again. Um, so 
that was that was that seeing mm -hmm. Barack Obama the backlash mm -hmm. to that being voter suppression looking at that coalition so that's the context now I'm going to fast forward to the 2016 election mm. <laughs> why isn't this vodka I know <laughs> I know um, <laughs> That's a good question. I think mine is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and, and one of the things is, as I'm watching the, the morning after, and I'm listening to the pundits, and these are supposedly the, the wise, learned folks who know politics and know, and they're like, mm, you know, black folks just didn't show up. You know, they just weren't feeling Hillary. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, yeah. Hillary. I mean, really, Hillary, and ooh, Hillary, yeah. and you know, and black folks couldn't get with Hillary because you know what? She's not Obama. <laughs> you know, if Obama's not running, black folks just aren't going to the polls because you know, because it's Hillary. And so you saw these things happening: the anti-Hillary, the misogyny that yeah. was coming through yeah. in the media. Yeah. But you also saw that this happened because black folks folks just stayed home. Mm -hmm. So again, America needs a narrative of black pathology. Yeah in order yes. to understand and rationalize why things are happening. So there's this major election and black folks just stayed home. And I'm sitting up there, oh see, I'm, I'm like you, you, I'm sitting up there shaking my head, yeah. right, right? Yeah. And, and I said, no, mm -hmm. this is the first election, presidential election in 50 years without the protection of the Voting Rights Act. That's right. And if we don't understand the power of the evisceration of the Voting Rights Act, and how these states, we had 30 states mm -hmm. implement a series of laws, mm -hmm. as they said with North Carolina, the Fourth Circuit said with North Carolina, that they had targeted African Americans with nearly surgical precision. That's right. Now, when you think about laws that target African Americans mm -hmm. with nearly surgical precision to keep them away from the voting booth, <laughs> in the 2016 election, Black voter turnout went down by 7%. Mm -hmm. 7%. When you think about the narrowed mm -hmm. electoral college victory of 77,000 votes right. that put Donald Trump in the White House. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. In Wisconsin. I'll just, Wisconsin was one of those electoral college states when you had a Republican regime that targeted Milwaukee where 70% of the state's black population lives. Mm -hmm. So you take out Milwaukee, you have done incredible damage. Yes. It was a targeted hit. There were 60,000 fewer votes cast in Wisconsin in 2016 than there were in 2012. 60,000 fewer. 68% of that drop happened from Milwaukee. Mm. Donald Trump won Wisconsin by barely 20-some thousand votes. Wow. That's mm -hmm. the power of voter suppression. Mm -hmm. And so it was, it was the need as a historian to put it into context because we've done this dance before. Yeah. Yeah. Um, with the Mississippi Plan of 1890. We've done this dance before because it's how do you take black folk out without saying you want to take black folk out? I, I want to talk about that a little more um, because the fact that this is not new. Oh, this is not new. <clears throat> We've seen this before. Yeah. And um, in your book, you discuss how voter suppression is really a response to uh, uh, keep down the freedom of free, new free black folks, right? It's, it's kind of a, it's engendered by white fear that black people are going to get political power. And you actually write. After Reconstruction, the plan was to take years of state-sponsored trickery and fraud and transform those schemes into laws that would keep blacks away from the voting booth, disfranchise as many as possible, and more important, ensure that no African American would ever assume real political power again. Yes. That didn't have to be after Reconstruction, right? <laughs> we can say that. Um, so, um, and then you also talk about how most of these efforts were blatant, like they weren't even hidden, right, and calculated. Mm -hmm. And you also go on to talk about the lit litany of tricks in the Mississippi plan yes. and to help disfranchise poor white folks, too. Oh, yes. 
And so I want you to talk about, so they were blatant and we know all the stuff they did and blah, 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 but I want you to talk about the sort of innocuous voter suppression that we see being used now, like you mentioned the ID, and that happened in the state of Alabama. Oh, yeah. Um, and how this is really a cover for more subtle forms of oppression. Okay, and so, and so that's why I'm gonna go back to the Mississippi plan on Good. this. Good. Because what, when we think of the rise of Jim Crow mm -hmm. we, and, and voter suppression, we often think of the violence that was done to black people who tried to vote. We think of the lynchings that happened when black people dared to vote. We think of the, their homes being burned out. I mean, we see, we kind of respond to the, the, the visceral violence, the right. visible violence. But what Mississippi figured out, and then the South went, oh, thank you, was how do we get around the 15th Amendment? Right. Because the 15th Amendment says, the state shall not abridge the right to vote on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. So how do you get around that 15th Amendment and say we don't want black folk to vote without writing a law saying we don't want black folk to vote? Right. And so what they did was they came up with using the societally imposed conditions on African Americans and making that the litmus test in terms of the access to the ballot box. So the poll tax. Mm -hmm. mm. <laughs> so the poll tax. So what you do is you have centuries of slavery. Then coming out of there, you got the black codes. Mm -hmm. Then coming out of there, you got sharecropping. Mm -hmm. You have embedded poverty. But what you say is you make it sound reasonable. You know, democracy is expensive. <laughs> and having all of these elections, you know, you got to have a polling place, and you got to have people looking folks up, and you got to have people taking the ballots, you got to have people counting the ballots. That's really expensive. And if people really cared about democracy, they would be willing to invest in it. So we don't think it's too much to ask to have them pay a tax. It's a small tax. <laughs> well, the average family income in Mississippi, family income, was $100 a year. Mm. Wow. Applying the poll tax, you were taking a, somewhere between 2 to 6% of the annual income of the family mm -hmm. to be able to vote. And the poll tax was cumulative. So if you couldn't figure out, because the rules were really arcane, so if you couldn't figure out how to pay it in the first year when you were eligible to vote, and it took you 20 years to figure it out. You owe 20 years of back poll taxes before you could cast there your you ballot. Go. There you go. Yeah. So the poll tax was lethal, yep. lethal. The same with the literacy test. You don't fund black schools. Mm -hmm. And we know that for many, um, black schools didn't go beyond like the fifth grade. There weren't high schools for black children. Then you require, you're like, but I think it would be a good thing <laughs> if people really knew the laws. And so I just think they just need to be able to read the Constitution. Right. So if what you do is you don't have <clears throat> adequate education, and then you require being able to read something that a Harvard law professor should be able to go through and interpret. Between the poll tax and the literacy test, by the time the U.S. is getting ready to fight Nazis in 1940, only 3% of African Americans in the South were registered to vote. Mm -hmm. Lethal. And the U.S. Supreme Court had ruled that the poll tax and the literacy test did not violate the 15th <coughs> Amendment. Yeah. Now, let me fast forward quickly. So now here we are. We still have the 15th Amendment. And so what we hear, you heard me talk about voter fraud, mm -hmm. voter fraud, voter fraud. Mm -hmm. We say, well, you know, we've got to protect the integrity of the ballot box. Mm -hmm. We've got to make sure that only eligible Americans are voting. We don't want people stealing our elections. Has anybody heard <laughs> any of this language? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so how hard is it to get an ID? Everybody's got an ID. You just need to prove you are who you say you are, and then you can vote. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me talk about Alabama. <laughs> you talk about Alabama a lot. Yeah, I, 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 cause, cause Al, you know, book. Alabama won't quit. <laughs> and there are times when Mississippi is looking up saying, thank God for Alabama. <laughs> so in Alabama, 
So in 2011, before the Voting Rights Act was gutted, the Alabama State Legislature crafted a law, a voter ID law, that was so racist mm -hmm. that they knew they couldn't get it through a Department of Justice preclearance review. Because right. this thing was bad, and they knew it. Because the Republicans had recorded themselves. How do we depress the black voter turnout? Because you know we'll get all of these aborigines and all of these illiterates getting on these HUD finance mm -hmm. buses and going to the polls. Mm -hmm. Now when you have recorded yourself saying that, and that's, <laughs> I'm thinking that this might be a racist law. Oh, I think so. Could be? Yeah, could yeah. be. So what they did then was they waited until after Shelby County v. Holder, and they implemented mm -hmm. it. Now, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund looked at this, because now it says you need a government-issued photo ID, and they've identified which government-issued photo IDs. LDF looks at this and says, but you know, we see that you don't have public housing ID on there here. And public housing ID is government issued photo ID. That's right. I mean, does it get more government issued than public housing? Right. So, and, and, and Alabama came back and said, no, that's not an acceptable form of government issued photo ID to vote. Mm -hmm. In Alabama, 71% of those in public housing are African American. Mm -hmm. So if you take out the ID, that African Americans have, and LDF had found out, for many, that was the only ID they had. Mm -hmm. And so then Alabama says, but you know, you, a driver's license. All you need is a driver's license. Then Governor Bentley shuts down the Department right. of Motor Vehicles right. in the Black Belt counties. That's right. That's right? right. So now, so the ID that I have that is government <laughs> issued can't get me into the ballot box. Right. Now you tell me I can get a driver's license, but now you have shut down the driver's license bureaus for fiscal reasons. <laughs> so now I got to drive 50 miles to the nearest driver's license bureau, but because I don't have a driver's license, I can't drive 50 miles. That's right. How am I doing so far? You're doing great. Yeah. Okay. okay. And so then pressure comes in from the Department of Transportation saying, open that stuff up. Mm -hmm. And Alabama's like, mm. <laughs> 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 and so, okay, fine, one day a month, two days a month. Right. Now you think about how you can get to a place if it's only open one day a month and you're trying. So what you do is first, built on this lie mm -hmm. of voter fraud, mm -hmm. you create an obstacle. You have to have an ID to vote. Then you create an obstacle to the obstacle. How am I going to get this ID? That's right. And Places like Alabama and North Carolina, they looked at the kinds of IDs that African Americans had and didn't have and crafted the laws accordingly. So it's subtle, you don't see it. What it did in Wisconsin is it depressed the black voter turnout by 27%. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 That works. That works. That's how this works. Quiet, subtly through the bureaucracy, and so we don't see the bodies, but we have electoral death all over the place. So Dr. Kennedy, I want to so, um, talk to you about the same sort of thing. So we know voter suppression is really pushback, and you talk about the intentionality of racism and basically racist practices and policies. You quote Jefferson Davis as saying, <laughs> This government was not founded by Negroes nor for Negroes, but by white men for white men. So how does that belief that white people are some, well, he said it, right? <laughs> okay, so how Wasn't does, he the yes, and right here, he took his oath of office on the steps of our Capitol. You can go see his star while you're here. But I thought the Confederacy was about Southern pride. Oh, yeah, <laughs> states' rights. That's what we call it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's funny how your words come back to yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. tell the truth. Mm -hmm. All right. So how does that belief that you talk about, these, these policies that come out of these belief systems, that white people are somehow superior to black people, undergird violence against black bodies, um, um, and um, this idea that um, voter suppression, unjust laws, and the inability to see people of color as equal or even human, mm -hmm. which you keep coming back to. Yeah, so I think, I think one of the things that I wanted to sort of show in, in Stamped from the beginning 
was I wanted to distinguish between the producers of racist ideas, yeah. the producers of this idea that there's voter fraud, um, that uh, Black Lives Matter mm -hmm. is a dangerous, violent terrorist uh, movement, yeah. um, that um, there's welfare queens, mm -hmm. uh, that the black family is broken, uh, that black neighborhoods are, are dangerous, yeah. uh, that white terrorists are just crazy. Um, <laughs> the people who produce these ideas mm -hmm. um, and, and mass circulate them, I want to distinguish between them and the people who consume these ideas. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the people who then consume them and then start believing them, yeah. right? And they start believing there is voter fraud. Mm -hmm. So I need to support these new laws uh, that, that suppress the vote mm -hmm. because there's voter fraud. And, and, it, and then some of these people then get their guns and, and they go to black districts and precincts thinking that they're going to fight against this mass voter fraud. Right. That actually happened in the 2016 election. Yes. And, and so the reason why I wanted to distinguish the two is because I think oftentimes we lump the two together and when we distinguish mm -hmm. the two, again, when we distinguish the producers of racist ideas from the consumers, we begin to see, and I began to see in, in Stamp from the beginning, the reason why these people were producing these ideas. And historically, it generally was not because they were ignorant or even hateful. Right. For instance, it was, they weren't saying that there's voter fraud because they were ignorant about the fact that there was not voter fraud. <laughs> right. Or that they just hated um, black people. Right. Um, now, black voters, that's a different issue. But, <laughs> um, and, but that's what we largely have been taught. Right. You know, I, I live in Washington, D.C., and, and typically when the president says something um, that is that I would consider to be a racist idea, the, the typical response is, oh, he's so ignorant. Mm. Right. Or he just hate Latinx people. Right. Um, or he just hates Muslims. Mm. And that's why he's saying these things. Um, and, and so that's what we've largely been taught. And, and I show and I argue, um, and I, I think uh, Carol does too in her work, that what's actually happening is these ideas are being produced to justify yes. racist policies that typically benefit those very people, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. and, and so Jefferson Davis, you know, as an example, um, Jefferson Davis was one of the, he was one of the few thousand um, white, part of one of the few thousand white families that owned the vast majority of, of slaves and, and wealth in the South. Um, and of course, those few thousand families that were the richest group of people in the world in 1860 mm -hmm. were looking over at five million poor whites and four million enslaved black people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and so how do we control mm -hmm. these people? How do we rule these people? Um, especially when more and more of those poor whites are hearing abolitionist literature, um, are beginning to question whether slavery is good for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and how do we ensure that our property in people and land will remain secure? That's right. And they began to realize that the way to do that was to formulate the Confederacy. Mm -hmm. um, and, but they, of course, weren't going to say that. Yeah. <laughs> right? They, they weren't specifically if they wanted those poor whites to fight the Civil War. That's right. Um, they weren't going to say that, and so they had to create a justification. They had to create a rationale to justify their, their new government. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's why that, that rationale, as Alexander Stevens said, and when he gave his cornerstone speech in 1861, Alexander Stevens was the vice president of the Confederacy. He said, this, this, this new government is is based on the great truth that the Negro is not equal to the white man mm -hmm. and that slavery subordination to the superior race is his natural and normal condition. Right. Mm. Um, and, and so they had to create a rationale for the Confederacy and that rationale was, was racist ideas. They had to create a rationale uh, for voter suppression policies and, and, and that was of course racist ideas. They have to create a rationale for the mass incarceration of people, mm -hmm. and, and that was racist ideas. They had to create a rationale uh, for banning Muslims, right. for uh, 
creating a border wall. Right. And, and that, of course, was, was racist ideas. And, and so I, that's what I try to show. Mm -hmm. These people are deeply concerned not um, about our safety, right. not about our welfare, <laughs> right. uh, not, our, not about our health. They're, they're deeply concerned about their political, economic, and, and, and cultural power. That's right. And they're going to use whatever ideological mm -hmm. means to convince you and I mm -hmm. that this world of racial inequity that benefits them primarily um, is actually normal mm -hmm. so right. that we won't fight it and instead we'll fight the victims of mm. racial inequity. Mm. Mm. You know, the, um, the, the sign or the measure of a successful ideology is that we think of it as natural. Mm -hmm. And that's what's happened. And so I want to stay on this idea of justification for, for just a minute. Um, and I want to talk about your chapter four, Saving Souls, Not Bodies, mm -hmm. where you write about the role of Christianity in colonial um, America. And you focus on Cotton Mather and uh, John Locke's new question. So I want you to sort of talk about that in particular because but we're in the South, right? And there ain't but one religion. <laughs> well, actually, there are two. There's Christianity and football, but we don't have to that. Um, but um, you you write um, uh, about uh, assimilation, assimilation, assimilationist ideas of Christianizing and civilizing enslaved Africans were particularly dangerous because they gave convincing power to the idea that slavery was just mm -hmm. and should not be resisted. Mm -hmm. Could you talk a little about the role of Christianity mm -hmm. and polygenesis, this idea that you sort of talk about throughout, as justification for racial differentiation and thus all these other things you talk about? Sure. So very quickly, I the, the stamp from the beginning is, is largely a history of three types of ideas, three okay. types of racial ideas. So two kinds of, of racist ideas mm -hmm. that are constantly struggling with anti-racist ideas. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways we can understand these two kinds of, of racist ideas is over the notion of creation. And, and so historically, segregationists have stated that the racial groups are created unequal. Um, and in the time of early America, um, and certainly colonial America, there was this theory of what was known as polygenesis, which essentially meant that every race was literally a different species of being, right. and every race had its own creation story. <laughs> and so black people, polygenesis argued, were not the descendants of Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. Black people had been created before Adam and Eve with the animals. Mm -hmm. and, and so they were literally a distinct group of, of people. While monogenesists made the case we're all created equal. Right. Black people are the, are the descendants of, of Adam and Eve. But they also stated that Adam and Eve were white. The Garden of Eden was in Europe, mm -hmm. <laughs> and that the descendants of Adam and Eve ventured into Africa, and that's when their beautiful white skins became dark and ugly. Mm -hmm. And so since we are all originally white, we have the capacity to solve the Negro problem by making the Negro white again. And the way that we do that is by urging black people from Ghana to, 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 to Montgomery to migrate back up to cooler climates where their skins will become white. Because again, if their skins became black because of the sun in Africa, then if they go to a northern climate, their white skin, their black skins will become white again. So that was monogenesis, right? And, and so these were the people who believed we were created equal. Mm -hmm. Whoa. This is what's critical. And, right. and so historically, monogenesists were arguing with polygenesists mm -hmm. over why black <laughs> yeah. people are inferior. Yes. And wow. another side of the debate, particularly along Christianity, was this debate between curse theorists mm -hmm. and climate theorists. Mm -hmm. So again, monogenesists were like, blackness is a result of the climate. 
curse theorists were like, no, blackness is the result of black people being the cursed descendants of Ham. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. That's right. So they can never become white. Mm -hmm. Their blackness is permanent. Mm -hmm. While climate theorists were like, no, it's just their hot sun. Let's just bring them up north, and we can make them white. And, and, and so as you, another debate, I mean, revolving around Christianity in early America, particularly colonial America, was whether black people could become Christian. Yeah. And that's the debate that Cotton Mather was involved in. And slaveholders, generally speaking, who knew in British common law that slaves, I'm sorry, that free people, I'm sorry, that Christians could not be slaved, mm -hmm. rejected yeah. the idea that mm -hmm. black people be, could become Christian. Because right. what would happen? If they became Christian, they, they can demand their freedom. So right. they were like, no, they can't become Christian. <laughs> right. They're naturally predisposed to devilish behavior, as those stated in the Salem witch trials. Uh, when they basically were stating that the devil is bewitching me, uh, and that devil is black, um, and, and they essentially are too barbaric to ever become Christian. Cotton Mather was like, no, let's separate the body from the soul. Mm -hmm. Of course, he was reading St. Paul, mm -hmm. and the body, he argued, can be permanently enslaved. But the soul, mm. the soul, he argued, mm -hmm can become white through becoming Christian. So let's minister to the soul and make the soul white by making it Christian. I'm emphasizing white because he imagined, as was imagined in the colonial America, that to be white was to be Christian, and to be Christian was to be white. Mm -hmm. And so even white Americans in, in, in America were, were typically identified as white Christian Americans. There was this interlocking of whiteness and Christianity. And, and so for him, if the soul became, if black people became Christian, by their souls becoming Christian, they would become white. Uh, while slaveholders were like, that's crazy. <laughs> the souls can never become white. They're black and ugly, and they will forever be ugly. Mm -hmm. And Cotton Mather, as a missionary, and other missionaries, figure out a way to substantiate slavery and still open up mm. this new crop of people who were not Christian to their proselytizing. And that's essentially how they went about doing it. Mm. Uh, and so that you have three different sort of debates that Christianity was sort of hovering around mm -hmm. that, that justified or did not justify slavery. I love the uh, sort of convoluted logic that runs through, <laughs> you know, all of these, all of these ideas. Yeah. So, um, Dr. Anderson, it seems that hierarchies are still um, at work, and the desire by some to purge the roles of more than just black people. Oh yes. Um, uh, those deemed unworthy of the right to vote. So, can you talk about? Mm some of the other communities that are being targeted for mm -hmm. voter suppression and why? So I, uh, yeah, let me. <laughs> oh gosh. <laughs> so in this last, in the 2018 midterm election, mm -hmm. uh, let, me, let me go back to the 2012. In 2012, um, Native Americans in North Dakota were absolutely essential in helping to elect Heidi Heitkamp to the U.S. Senate. And that stunned, I'm going to use a technical term here, the bejeebers <laughs> <laughs> out of folks. I, you know, and the Republicans were like, oh, how did that happen? This has always been a Republican seat. How did that? Well, Native Americans voted, and the margin of difference was a little over 2,000 votes. Mm -hmm. And so that was 2012. In 2013, the Republican legislature in North Dakota passed a voter ID law that said they would only accept three types of IDs. Uh, North Dakota driver's license, North Dakota non-driver's license ID, and a tribal ID. And there, had, there were some if-then-but clauses mm -hmm. in that. Mm -hmm. In each subsequent bill, they started closing the if-then-but clauses. In, I think it was September, of this year, of 2018, right before the election. And remember, we've already had Standing Rock happen 
That's right. Thing, right. That's right. Right. In about 20 September or so, they passed a law that said you had to have, in order to stop voter fraud, they didn't have any cases, but in order to stop it, what had, what hadn't happened, right? <laughs> the massive voter fraud. Yeah, the massive rampant voter fraud. Right, right. You had to have a street address on your ID. Well, the tribal IDs do not have addresses mm -hmm. on them. Mm -hmm. And 60, over 60% 60 of Native American people in North Dakota live on reservations. Reservations do not have street addresses. So how you take a group out is, again, to take a societally imposed condition because they're on reservations. Mm -hmm. And then you make the condition of the reservation the litmus test in order to be able to access the ballot box. And so, of course, they sued. Mm -hmm. What the judge said was that it was important to stop massive rampant voter fraud. The state had a compelling interest. Mm -hmm. And that there was enough time with, I think it was by this time it was like six weeks left, <laughs> <laughs> for the people, for the Native American people to get a physical address. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm like, I'm reading You have this. to laugh. I mean, it, and it's like. So you won't cry. So, so part of what we're seeing here, because there has been a, a political and legal paradigm shift after the gutting of the Voting Rights Act. What the Voting Rights Act did, one of the things that made the Voting Rights Act so powerful is that it put the onus of upholding the Constitution, the 15th Amendment, on the states. Mm -hmm. The gutting of it has put the onus on the individual. So now Native American people have to get their own physical address within six weeks in order to be able to vote. So it's wow. not on the state to come up with it. They have to come up with it. And so you saw massive organizing happening, mm -hmm. trying to come up with ways to get a physical address. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Texas. Oh, Lord. I knew you were going to go there. You knew I was going to Texas. I, I had to go to Texas. <laughs> Lord bless them. Texas. One of the things Texas, okay, so what Trump talks about is all of these illegals. Yeah. People cannot be illegal. But the language of defining a human being as illegal, mm -hmm. that that is their alpha and their omega, mm -hmm. is a process of dehumanizing them. Mm -hmm that then makes them vulnerable to whatever the society will do. That's right. Okay. And so the, the illegals are voting. The illegals are voting. They're mm -hmm. stealing our election. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that they've done is to put enormous pressure on the immigrant community, the Latino community. In January of this year, the interim uh, Secretary of State David Whitley held a major press conference. I mean, and it was like, and he said, it was, it was so Joseph McCarthy, in my hand, oh, God. I have a list. And he had 95,000 people who were on the voter rolls who were not U.S. citizens. Wow. You, I mean, the, it was just, whew. Trump went, I told you, <laughs> I massive rampant voter fraud. It's like it's even worse in California. Lord, he hates California. It's even <laughs> worse in California. And we need strong voter ID. Mm -hmm. Now, <laughs> there, and he said 58,000 of these folks have already voted. And you had the gears gearing up, and we're going to purge them off. Well, it turns out that the database that they were using doesn't actually track whether somebody who got their driver's license subsequently was a natural, became a naturalized citizen. Right. And the database they were using, the list that they were using, was over a 20-year span. 
So over a 20 year span, mm, given that about 50,000 people become naturalized citizens in Texas every year, they had about a million folk who became citizens over that span. Mm -hmm. But you wouldn't have been able to tell it from that high powered press conference. 95,000, 58,000 have voted and the purges began, mm. wiping citizens off the voter rolls. It was only because, I mean, right now the thin blue line that is saving us, <coughs> besides people who are engaged, civil society. Mm -hmm. It is the ACLU, the Legal Defense Fund, the NAACP, LULAC, uh, NARF, all of them coming in and suing the bejeebers. Mm -hmm. There goes that techno <laughs> yeah. term again. <laughs> You know, the states, because they're going, stop this. You're violating the Constitution. You're violating the Constitution. So voter roll purges by, and, and what they did in North Carolina was to have ICE come in, request 15 million voting records from North Carolina, looking at non-citizens. So what that does is, you know, ICE brings terror. Mm -hmm. And so it tells you, maybe I don't need to be voting. If they're looking at voting records, right. then maybe right. I just need to stay off of any list that has me voting. Right. So using intimidation is one of the ways. What they did in Georgia. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Wow. Brian Kemp. Mm -hmm. There is a program in Georgia called Exact Match. What it's supposed to do is to deal with uh, voter fraud. And so it matches up your, your voter registration with then information that's in the state's databases, the driver's license database, or the Social Security Administration. But exact match means exactly that. So if your name is Renee, and you write it with an accent, mm -hmm and the state database doesn't have the accent, your voter registration is kicked over into electoral limbo. If your name is Jose Garcia Marquez, and you put a hyphen between Garcia and Marquez, but they don't put a hyphen in the state database, you're kicked off. Now, when this program was running originally under Brian Kemp, the courts ruled that the program exact match was racially discriminatory because it privileged anglicized names because they were really having problems with uh, Shaniqua Shante, right? <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> the Georgia legislature yeah. then implemented a law exact match that the policy that the courts had just ruled was racially discriminatory, then the Georgia legislature implemented it again. Mm -hmm. And so in this past election, after Brian Kemp had purged as many people as he could uh, before the, the deadline date, he then, we found out on the last day that people could be registered to vote in order to vote in, in the November election, that he had held 53,000 voter registrations because of exact match. Mm -hmm. 70% of those held were African American. Mm -hmm. Only 9% were white. Mm -hmm. The others were Asian American and um, Hispanics. So you get in that voting pool an ability to wipe out folks based on their names. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There was also Chris Kobach's exact, not, uh, Chris Kobach's cross check. Mm -hmm that at one point was in over 30 states. Mm -hmm. It had an error rate of 99.9%. <laughs> what? I'm just wrong. wrong. Just, that what, means it was working efficiently. <laughs> 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 what it was designed to do, ostensibly, was to catch people who were registered in multiple states and going from state to state voting to <laughs> To, to tilt elections, and you can't Who make this. Who are these people? Right, Who are these people? You can't make this stuff up. Oh I mean, God. it's like when you say it out loud. Yeah. <laughs> 
And, and, but what happens then is that, so what it's supposed to do is it's supposed to look at first name, middle initial, last name, suffix junior, senior, last four of your social security, and date of birth. But it doesn't. They really pay no attention to social security. They don't pay much attention to date of birth. They really don't care about your middle initial. There's some kind of meh on your first name, but they really focus in on your last name. Mm -hmm. The problem with that is that 85 of the 100 most common last names in America are overpopulated by minorities. Mm -hmm. If your last name is Lee or Young, there's a good chance you're Asian American. Mm -hmm. If your last name is Washington, there's mm -hmm. almost an 89, 90% chance that you're African American. Right. If your last name is Garcia, there's over a 90% chance that you're Hispanic. And so when you perseverate mm -hmm. on the last name, it is a way to wipe out Asian Americans, remember the Obama hit list? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Asian Americans, Hispanics, and African Americans. Mm -hmm. And that's what it has done. So African Americans are overrepresented on cross check, and they've wiped over a million people off of the rolls. Um, overrepresented by 41%. No, 45%. Asian Americans by 31%, and Hispanics by 24%. Whites are underrepresented on the purges by 8%. So again, this is a way you can call the electorate to get the electorate so you can get politicians choosing their voters instead of voters choosing who their representatives will be. I'm going to ask two last short questions, and then we'll open it up for the audience. Um, so I wanted to um, ask Dr. Kendi, um, you quote Joe Biden, as, uh, that his famous saying, he's the first mainstream African American who is articulate and bright and clean Lord and a nice looking guy about the then presidential hopeful Barack Obama. And um, naming him, your, your words, the extraordinary Negro, what we call the magical Negro, <laughs> you know. So um, how can, you, if someone of good intentions has internalized these racist notions that cause them to say, even when they're trying to say something positive, something terribly racist, um, how can we go about uh, eradicating these or changing these racist notions? So I think first by defining what a racist idea is. Okay. And so that's why you know, the book was subtitled Definitive History, because mm -hmm. really that's what I wanted to ultimately do. Mm -hmm. And I think we have a, a nation of people who generally do not have a definition of a racist or right. a racist idea, but will swear on their Bible that they are not racist. Right. Which is in direct contradiction. Right. You can't know you're not something if you don't know what something is. Right. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, I think that that's, it's almost this religion among Americans to say, I'm not racist. Mm -hmm. and, and so for me, I think it's two things. To first, define what a racist idea is. And I define a racist idea as any idea that suggests a racial group is superior or inferior to another racial group mm -hmm. in any way. I should also say that typically now we don't say superior and inferior. We say this is what's wrong, this is what's right mm -hmm. um, with this particular mm -hmm. group. Um, and then the second thing is for us to realize there's no such thing as being a not racist. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I, I don't know what not racism is. <laughs> uh, I can't find the history of not racism. <laughs> the, the only thing I can find is people in denial about their racism. Yeah. And just so you know, Richard Spencer, David Duke, mm -hmm. Donald Trump, um, anyone, slaveholder, segregationist, slave traders, these all were people who said, I'm not racist. Right. And, and so for me, we have to realize that the contrast is between racist and anti-racist. Okay. And, and intention mm -hmm. and goodwill mm -hmm. and what you want um, and, the, and the person you imagine yourself to be is completely irrelevant. Right. <laughs> to whether you're expressing ideas that suggest certain racial groups are equal, um, certain racial groups are superior or inferior, or whether you 
are defending and supporting policies that create racial mm -hmm. inequity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, it seems that people are not really worried about being racist. They just are worried about being called racist. <laughs> yeah. Precisely. And, and I think that that is, is fundamentally a reflection um, of our denial. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that I'll also add, and I think this is also absolutely critical, I don't think people understand the ways in which being racist mm -hmm. harms them. Yeah. Mm. So let's yeah. even specifically talk yeah. about white people. Yeah. Um, one, of, one of the funniest uh, movies in, in the 90s was this long movie with the Wayan brothers. Um, it was set in, in LA, Stop Drinking Juice or something in the hood. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And there's this skit where you have <laughs> this racist uh, shopkeeper and this black person comes into the store, and the shopkeeper's following the black person around, of course, because they must be the crook. Meanwhile, you have white people come in the store with a trash bag and start <laughs> cleaning, cleaning that person's you know, shop out. Or in the case of when it comes to medicine. Right. If you believe that there's such thing as black blood and white blood and, mm -hmm. and black diseases and white diseases and that the races are genetically distinct, then as a physician, mm -hmm. if you believe only black people can have sickle cell anemia, mm -hmm. when, when a white person who is from Italy or mm -hmm. Greece or other parts of Southern Europe mm -hmm. presents with symptoms of sickle cell anemia, you're gonna completely miss it. Right. Which then is gonna cause that person's disease to get worse. Mm -hmm. Or if you believe that black people should be incarcerated by the millions and, and, and we should you know, use money to, mm -hmm. to, to build prisons and prison cells all over Alabama and all over this country, mm -hmm. then you're going to look the other way when they're taking money from the University of Alabama and other public universities to fund those prisons. Right. Even though you were planning to send your children to those very public universities. And now the cost of those universities wow. yes. Right. Yes. Are, are, are astronomical. Yes. Right. And, and we don't even, people don't even make the connection between the rising cost of education and the rising cost of prisons. Right. Um, people don't make the connection between putting people into office because apparently these people said that they were going to go after the criminals, they were gonna go after the welfare recipients, they were gonna go after the affirmative action handouts, they were gonna go after the terrorists, and then they get into office and they steer money and funds and resources in the safety net away from pretty much all Americans, including the white middle class. And then the white middle class begins to suffer, and then they start talking about words like economic inequality. Right. And then we completely forget yeah. how there was a tremendous amount of equality in the 1950s and 1960s, particularly for white people. And then what happened yeah. in the intervening years? Yeah. And people disconnect mm -hmm. the ways in which they were mass manipulated by racist ideas. Right to support people who were then going to harm them. Right. Yes. And, and I think that's why it's, it's, you know, I don't want to be called a racist, but by acknowledging our racism, right. we are no longer going to be able to be manipulated. Yes. Yes. Yeah. How is voter suppressing, suppression ruining democracy? <laughs> Destroying our democracy? In so many ways. Mm -hmm. You know, so I'll start with the fundamentals and then just keep moving. One of the things that a democracy requires is a belief in the democracy. Mm -hmm. What voter suppression does is it makes people believe that the system is so rigged that they don't even have a right to participate in it, can't participate in it, and you get an alienated society. Mm -hmm. When you have millions of people alienated from the absolute operation of that society, you're in trouble. You're in major trouble. We're in trouble. Yeah. Two, is that, and it, I mean, it's, it's, it, it feels like we're just mm -hmm. playing here because, I mm -hmm. mean, mm -hmm. it's because I was just co signing with you. Mm -hmm. Gerrymandering. Let's take gerrymandering. Mm. Mm. Yes, okay. We know all about that in Alabama. <laughs> 
I mean, I guess, right? You, and so the way that extreme partisan gerrymandering works is that you get these massive inequities. So it destroys one person, one vote. Mm -hmm. In North Carolina, Republicans won 50.2% of the vote and got 77% of the congressional seats. Mm. In, in Wisconsin, um, what they did in Wisconsin is that the, you know, as the Republicans went into a hotel room and locked themselves in there for four months with powerful software mapping software and Cambridge analytic data, kind of, to figure out who lived where as they're drawing the maps. And in drawing the maps, they said we have two goals. Mm -hmm. One is to get rid of competitive districts. If we can get rid of enough competitive districts, we can depress the voter turnout. Because if you think that so-and-so is going to win because so-and-so always wins, then there's no reason for you to go out and vote. Mm. But in there, when there's a competitive race and you believe that your vote counts, mm -hmm. you turn out. So we get higher turnouts in competitive races. We get lower turnouts without competitive districts. Mm -hmm. You eliminate enough competitive districts, you can depress the voter turnout because people believe that their vote doesn't count because mm -hmm. XYZ is going to win anyway. That was one of their goals. The second goal was that regardless of how many votes the Republicans get, they will have the majority of the seats and the majority of the power in the state legislature. Think about that in terms of democracy. Regardless of how many votes they get, they will always have the most. Mm. So the first time they implemented this, they received, no, I'm gonna do it the flip way because that's the way my brain works. Democrats received 52% of the vote and got 39% of the seats. Mm. And so the way that you do that is you draw the districts in such a way that you highlight, overemphasize white suburban areas and white rural areas where they get more districts and you clump together, they call it packing. You pack together black areas. And so they can have two million people in there but they get one representative. Gotcha. Whereas these areas that 10,000 in this county, 19,000 in this county, and they'll get three. Mm -hmm. What that has done then is it has skewed the congressional leadership so that in Congress, uh, I know it's a long way to get there, in Congress, we, because of partisan gerrymandering, extreme partisan gerrymandering, we have somewhere, we had somewhere between 16 to 26 additional Republican legislators. Republican members in the House of Representatives in Congress, when they were figuring out how to gut the Affordable Care Act, mm -hmm. when they were figuring out how to pass the tax code, anybody, how you do with your April 15th? Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm. Let's not speak on it. <laughs> this is what this means. And so, whereas it looks like, it, just like the power of the Southern Democrats during the Jim Crow era, and how that shaped our civil rights legislation and what we could do and what we couldn't do, what voter suppression does is it not only taints our local elections and our local state policies, but it also taints our national policies. Mm -hmm. Because we've got people who are in power now who are not beholden to the electorate. Right because they have carved these districts in such a way to create safe districts. So they feel that they're, they're, they're um, not vulnerable. That's why they don't listen to public opinion. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, right? You right. Know? So, so when you look at what public opinion, for instance, is saying about we really want access to good health care. Right. We really need good health care because now that health insurance has basically been decoupled from employment, mm -hmm. which had been our old model, We've got too many people who are working from Kate to Kate, but they can't afford health care. Right. So we need something that works. But if you've got that decoupling that we've had with, with partisan gerrymandering, mm -hmm. we don't have the policies that are matching up with the will of the people. That is how, so, so, and, and so that is how voter suppression is destroying our democracy. We, we don't have policymakers who are responsive to the will of the people. 
We have people who are being targeted because of their race or their class who are basically being told, you don't have a say in this government. Mm -hmm. You don't have a say in this democracy. You don't have a say in who your representatives will be. And if you do think you'll have a say, so you think about when you put your name on a voter list and your name is Martinez, mm -hmm. and you now know that ICE is looking at the records. Mm -hmm. We're doing enormous damage. And I will say, because I, I, Donald Trump is in power because of voter suppression. Yeah. He is in power and doing the damage that he is doing because of voter suppression. Yeah. That is how it is destroying democracy. over, oh, but do we have a question? Do we have a question, a burning question that people would like to ask? Okay, I see burning questions. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my question is uh, for Dr. Anderson or Dr. Kendi. Um, I teach college students who their whole lives are online. And I'm, I'm, your comments about gerrymandering, about these electronic services that governments are using, how do we tell them that, you know, artificial intelligence is getting better and what might be the impact of that kind of technology on all of these policies and procedures that governments are using to suppress voters? Well, you know, one of the things that happened in the 2016 election, and this has been well documented, is that um, the Russians, understood the racial fissures in America mm -hmm. really well and began to target black communities because they knew if they could take black folks out, they could take Hillary out. Mm -hmm. And so you started seeing on, in social media, so the first thing that the Russians would do was to get their, their, their street cred bona fides. Mm -hmm. Right, yo, bro, what's up? Oh man, how they took that brother down. Can you believe they shot a brother down like that? So, you know, so you're getting this online community and they, they would have a fake picture up there and a fake name like, yo, I be bad, bro. And, <laughs> and, oh, and then as that conversation would go on and people get a sense of intimacy in social media, like you know this person, mm -hmm. then it would say, and you know, Hillary, did you hear that super predator mess, man? You know, and they're all alike. Hill, Hillary's like Trump. You know, let's show them our power. Let's not vote. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The messages, we've got the documentation about how they targeted activists in key communities and how they went after black folks like that. Mm -hmm. Because they, you know, because the mar they knew the margins were thin enough. And so part of the work that we have to do is to be able to understand, there's several things. Part of the work is that we have to be able, to, in working with our students, to be able to understand what this kind of targeting does. How do you spot a bot, mm -hmm. right? What, what are the triggers for that? The other thing that we have to do, frankly, and, and is to deal with the racism in America. Because the Soviets, the Soviets, Lord, I'm a Cold War historian. <laughs> um, and, but the Soviets did it too, right? I mean, it, 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 I, I studied that. So the, is, is to deal with the racism in America because it wouldn't have worked if the fissures hadn't already been there. If we hadn't drawn targets already around key groups saying, we've got to take them out, we've got to take them down. So that, in fact, showed the, damn, I almost said the Soviets again, showed the Russians exactly where to hit. Mm -hmm. So there's, that's where part of the work is, but it is also in developing the kind of savvy about social media that is absolutely important as well. Um, I have a question. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you all so much for coming to Montgomery, Alabama. Yeah. Thank you. My yeah. brother, I brought my book. <laughs> I didn't have to get here. I already 
fine. <laughs> and I follow you. I'm a stalker. But anyway, um, <laughs> I just wanted to let you know that, you know, you're in, in the cradle of the Confederacy. And I want something that's hopeful. You all have you're done an excellent job. I'm getting ready to get your book. An excellent job on presenting what the issues are. But I give tours of Montgomery, Alabama. And it pains me to have to tell people that we have treason in Jefferson Davis, and your book has really helped me because some of the language that he uses when it you know, comes down to Negroes and slaves. And then on the opposite side, we have James Marion Sims. And when you try to have a conversation with um, your community, it just seems like, oh, but you know, they've done great work. But now we're getting ready to erect Richard Montgomery, um, you know, which is another slave owner, right? And nobody wants to talk about things, these things. So I'm asking you all the question, how do we have this conversation? Number one, because our governor has doubled down and said no uh, statue will be removed. You know, we have this Preservation Act, so when you're talking about voting, you know, how do we awaken uh, the rest of our community and have these real conversations about some of the people and the monuments that we idolize here in Montgomery, Alabama, the cradle of the Confederacy? So I know that's a hard question, but I need something hopeful because again, when I give these tours, I get mad all over again, every day. <laughs> it's like Groundhog's Day. Oh, here we go. You know? <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm going to take part of this and then turn it over. So in this book, because it can be really depressing, because I first I do the history of disfranchisement, then a chapter on voter ID and how that thing works, a chapter on voter roll purges, and then a chapter on gerrymandering and rigging the rules. I mean, by the t it's like that last chapter is on the resistance. Yeah. And I focus in on Alabama mm -hmm. and the Doug Jones, Roy Moore. Yes! yes! Because that's where the hope is. Because Alabama, as you know, John Merrill had applied every method of voter suppression yes. on the black community. Yes. He went full bore hardcore. Mm -hmm. And then Roy Moore popped up and black folks said, not today, Satan. <laughs> <laughs> And they, and they, but they had to figure out how do we get through, around, over, and under all of these barriers. Mm -hmm. And you had civil society coming in. And so part of what they did was they just started talking to black folk. Mm -hmm. What's important to you? Mm -hmm. And they started talking about, I want good schools for my babies. <laughs> I want decent health care. You know, I, I want, if I get sick, I need to know I'm going to get taken care of. And I prefer not to get sick. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I want to work where I'm working and I can afford to live. Mm -hmm. you know, so as they started talking about what was just important to them, then the, the activists who had come in, and they made sure that they had Alabamians talking to Alabamians. These weren't folks from New York mm -hmm. trying to talk to folk from Alabama. Mm -hmm. These were Alabamians talking to Alabamians saying, so you know what that means then. So, and began to do the translation work because part of what we have done in this society is we have put like the stuff that's important to us, policies that are important to us, housing, healthcare, decent jobs, clean water over here. And politicians, it, politics is, oh, that's that stuff over there. It doesn't matter. We link those two together or we think of it more as like celebrity dog instead of the hard work of democracy. Mm -hmm. Link, linking those two together and then providing ways, so from the, uh, the moral turpitude piece that dealt with felony disfranchisement yeah. to, mm -hmm, to the uh, developing a private car system because 66 polling stations were closed, most of them in the black communities, right. so that people could get to the polls, to uh, information about whether you were registered or not. I mean, there was a whole network of using um, uh, civil society, NAACP, ACLU, uh, students at Alabama State, the, the black Greek organizations, I mean, the churches, everybody was in there. And y'all took Roy Moore down. I'm he See, that's where the hope is. Sometimes we, we, it looks daunting. Movements always look daunting. And movements, you don't get the one quick victory and you're done. It's like you got you scored a because uh, I'm in I'm in Bama country now. <laughs> you, you got a first down. You ain't won the game. Right. It's a first down, right. but it means you're still in the game. Right. 
<laughs> so, and, and so in movement, it is thinking through that this is a long series of battles. And we've won some. And we've got to embrace and celebrate those. Then we have to sit back and think about what happened with the opposition on this other side where they were able to, to, to maneuver around this way. Mm -hmm. Because we're coming back again. And that's what's important to remember. And so it looks, like I said, it looks daunting. But I, as I tell my students, that's why they call it the struggle. <laughs> <laughs> The struggle is real. Struggle is real. And the reason they're fighting so hard is because we do refuse to give up. Mm -hmm. We refuse to, when I talk about it in white rage, mm -hmm. it's not mm -hmm. the presence of black people that produces white rage. Right. It is the presence of black people who refuse to give up. Right. It is the presence of black people with aspirations, the presence of black people who achieve. Mm -hmm. And because black people refuse to give up. Wow. Think about the power of that. That's where the hope is. That's where the hope is. I don't know how I can follow that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mean, right. I mean, I, I, would, I would just say, I mean, I think if I was someone who lived in Montgomery and I was seeking hope, um, you know, I would first and foremost, think about the history uh, of this city and its surrounding counties. Mm -hmm. And when I would think of the history of this city and, and surrounding counties, I would think of people like Booker T. Washington. Mm -hmm. uh, I would think of uh, people like, of course, Rosa Parks. I mean, mm -hmm. I would think of um, the Lowndes County Black Panther Party. Mm -hmm. yes. um, mm -hmm. I would think of Joanne Robinson. Um, and, and then, of course, even fast forwarding it to the present, I mean, you know, two of the most nationally renowned uh, organizations fighting against racism yes. uh, in this country are based in Montgomery, right. in EGI and Southern Poverty Law Center. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if, if there's a place that has a rich history of struggle mm -hmm. and a risk present of struggle mm -hmm. um, and has long been the center uh, of anti-racist uh, uh, activity, uh, it's Montgomery. Yeah. And so that's what I would sort of, that's what would give me hope living mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. um, and in terms of the Confederacy, you know, how do you have that conversation? I mean, I, we were talking earlier, I, um, um, well, actually I was, uh, I was, um, talking to Brian Stevenson earlier, and I, I told him how I have pretty much memorized Alexander Stevens' speech in 1861, in which he gave the cornerstone mm -hmm. of the Confederacy speech, in which he laid down the principles uh. of the speech. Or, you know, when, when, when Jefferson Davis said the inequality between the white and black races was stamped from the beginning. Yeah. Right, all of these things, if people want to have a conversation about the Confederacy, if you want to have a conversation that this Confederate uh, aggression led to more deaths, American deaths, than any other American war, led yes. to more white American deaths yes. than any other war. Yeah. Um, if you want to talk about the amount of poverty and misery mm -hmm. that Southern Confederates suffered yeah. during the war, let alone you know, enslaved people and, and Northerners, if you want to talk, I mean, you know, let's have this conversation. And, and so I try to, uh, you know, be, have, be as knowledgeable about the Confederacy uh, as possible. And the Confederacy was anti-human and anti-white, let alone anti-sort of black, let alone pro-slavery. Pro it was anti-everything, mm -hmm. except a small group of super rich mm -hmm. white men. Mm -hmm. right? and everything else and everyone else. Yeah. So if you're not rich and white and male, <laughs> and when I mean rich, I mean like billionaire rich, right. Right? Right. then it seemed to me that the Confederacy was not representing you. Mm. Um, and and, and, mm. it's, and it's, that's a fact, mm. and, and that's how I sort of talk about mm -hmm. it. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah. And I, uh, I believe there may be two Confederate memorials here in this yeah. building. 
This will be our last question. And on these grounds? Um, my question's for Dr. Kendi. The, uh, I, I can't wait to read the book, actually. Uh, one of my favorite persons to listen to is Tim Wise mm -hmm. and how he discusses, especially with lower income white people, you know, how everything is, how that, they're combined together. And what he talks about is Richard Spencer um, and, and when he was running for president or running for, uh, running for national office in Louisiana and how the very same neighborhood skewed on racial lines and how it was skewed down the voting line, and they're the same people in the same economic standpoint. Um, so I appreciate that. Uh, my question is a little bit more historical. My wife and I went to Whitney Plantation uh, outside of New Orleans, in between there and Baton Rouge, uh, on the German coast, what they called it. Uh, so the original plantation was German. And what they talked about how they, with the Christianity part, uh, that they forced the enslaved people to convert to Christianity and they provided them with a Bible where they had kind of stricken out uh, anything negative about slavery. It was always something that, you know, like the Jewish people being enslaved and you know, how they grew from it and things like that. And that's kind of how they pushed it. Uh, is, is that something that is different as... Because you mentioned Savannah and the East Coast, is that something different than what would have been seen with, uh, you know, a different European group of people down with, in the German and French areas? Yeah. So, um, so I think Cotton Mather. I mentioned Cotton Mather. Right. Mm -hmm. He largely won the debate, and and the way in which he argued that not only should should black people uh, become um, should, 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 should missionaries and, and ministers have the ability to, to minister to the souls of these people? But he also argued, and, 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 and ministers and theologians, pro-slavery ministers and theologians would argue this to the end of the Civil War. Even Harriet Beecher Stowe argued this in her Uncle Tom's Cabin. And, and this was that, that Christianity, and by converting back people to Christianity, they could convert them to docility. Mm -hmm. That was the argument. Mm -hmm. Because let's preach a form of Christianity mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. teaches you mm -hmm. that you are, to, you are supposed to okay. essentially look up to your master as your master looks up to God. Right. And that is the fundamental sort of uh, earthly and then heavenly hierarchy. So you're at the bottom. You're, yeah. you're supposed to. And of course, they would cite Bible passages. Mm -hmm. Uh, from St. Paul and others mm -hmm. that would substantiate that. All of that stuff about uh, in Israel, no, I don't want you reading any of that about you know, people liberating themselves. Yeah. No, Exodus no, 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 no. Gone. no yeah. That's what the liberation theologians mm -hmm. you know, in the backwoods mm -hmm. <laughs> would do. But in terms of the ministers, they would consistently uh, come in and, and preach uh, docility, uh, using the Bible to do so. And, and to a certain extent, um, that is still being done. Mm -hmm. And I should also add, I mentioned Harriet Beecher Stowe, because she made the case in, in Uncle Tom's Cabin, which was the best-selling book of the 19th century, uh, the only book that sold more was the Bible, yeah. that the reason why black people made good Christians is because they were servile people. Right. And to be good Christians, you had to be servile. Mm -hmm. And the reason why white people made bad Christians was because they were not servile. Mm -hmm. And that what white people need to do through abolition was to become servile, mm -hmm. which would then make them better Christians. Mm -hmm. That's why that message in that book, that anti-slavery message, was so powerful mm -hmm. to so many people. Yes, I'm going to start becoming more servile through preaching against slavery, and therefore I'm going to be able to become a better Christian. Mm -hmm. um, the reason why I mention you know, that it is, it is still being taught, like a, a form of Christianity um, that is still being taught is, is, is what I sort of loosely call in my next book, uh, uh, Savior Theology. 
Um, and I contrast that with liberation theology. Mm -hmm. and, and, and what I mean by savior theology is that it's the job of the Christian um, and the Christian community to essentially save, literally, uh, these behaviorally and culturally deficient people. And that's our job. So we're trying to bring them to Christ to literally save them from their own barbarism. And, and whether that's black people or even poor white people, anybody, mm -hmm. right? And while liberation theology that imagines that Jesus was a revolutionary mm -hmm. imagines the church and Christianity as, as a place and a space that seeks to free the people from the institutions in the way the, Jesus' allies were seeking to free him from the Romans. So it's a completely right. different set of theology. And, and, and so, of course, the slaveholders were preaching a, a slaver theology, and, mm -hmm. and many of the enslaved people were remixing it into a more liberation theology. Yeah, yeah and, and I'll just say, thank you. I would just say that when you think about the civil rights movement, right, yeah. when we think about is that you actually had a battle happening within um, the Baptist, Black Baptist, mm -hmm. Um, right. Because you had one wing that was, we're going to get ours in the by and by. You mm -hmm. know, we're, we're you know, right. you, you, you deal with the mess here on earth, and that's what's going to get you into heaven. Mm -hmm. And so it was, it was this docility that you're talking mm -hmm. about. And the other wing was like, no, we're going to get it now. Yeah. <laughs> you know, this is on we're Christian soldiers. And so that kind of, of battle. And so mm -hmm. one of the things that is is fascinating for me is the way black folk take the things that have been used to, to try to destroy them and yeah. they flip it into a way that of liberation, into a way of power. Right. Um, so we see that in terms of Christianity is one of those things. We, we see it in terms of education that is to create, make you docile to in fact think about it in terms of the way that you get free. Mm -hmm. um, and we see that in terms of um, um, Robin Kelly's book on black communist in Alabama, um, how communism was designed in one way and black folk took it and took it in another way so that they could get free. Mm -hmm. So that kind of using the tools for freedom is, is, is to me is a consistent theme that we're seeing throughout this history of, of, of this larger, longer freedom struggle. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, one more. Okay. Hey, how are you? Um, I want to thank both of the doctors for doing for all that you do. I just want to give you a thank you and a special shout out to the HBCU man, uh, <laughs> Dr. Kendi. Um, <laughs> I went to FAMU. <laughs> I'm All sorry, State grad. We'll forgive you for that. <laughs> um, you, Dr. Anderson, you mentioned the Aborigines earlier, um, and I wanted to bring that up. The 1828 Noah Webster's Dictionary uh, mentions the term American, and for American it says, a native of America, originally applied to the Aboriginals or copper-colored races found here by the Europeans, but now applied to the descendants of Europeans born in America. I wanted to ask, um, how do you feel what Walter Plecker, Plecker did on the east coast of the country and how he re got so many um, Indians reclassified as black, colored, Negro, and things of that nature? How long do you think it will take for the original people of the Americas to, I guess, uh, correct a lot or undo a lot of the evil things that he did in his time? Um, as it pertains to things like the uh, Racial Integrity Act of 1924 and things of that nature. How much time do we have? <laughs> because, so, so part of what we're, um, I can't speak to that specifically, but it sounds like what you're asking is um, part of the work that has been done in America has been kinds of racial classifications and declassifications mm -hmm. that then, then deal with the way that a people see themselves, the way that they identify, right. the way that they understand their place. And what it takes to undo that work is a lot of hard work. A lot of hard work both within the community and outside the community. Um, it's the work that, that says that I own me. It's about work of self-determination. Mm -hmm. And that is, 
And so one of the things that I saw, for instance, um, in North Dakota in the Plains, was that you had the North Dakota legislature doing its best to define the, the Sioux, the Lakota, um, the Chippewa, um, the Spirit Lake Nation folks in one sort of way. And you had them, you had those folks redefining themselves in their own way to where uh, one man said, oh, we see what they're doing. We're getting ready to warrior up. <laughs> I was like, whoa. Mm -hmm. So it is that work that is happening where elders and youth are really reclaiming their history mm -hmm. because it is that reclamation of history instead of the, the, the retelling of same old tired pat narratives that becomes the ways that people begin to understand who they are and who they aren't and the work that was done to, to, to destroy their very sense of being. And I want to thank you both for the work you have done to help us understand who we are and who we aren't. Oh, thank you.